my heart again. Your love is extravagant. Your friendship Intoxicating in a secret place, and your love is extravagant. Spread wide in the arms of Christ, there's a love that covers sin. Stars set, and they wait 
Good morning, everyone. It's good to see you all. Happy Mother's Day to all you mothers out there. It's a wonderful day to celebrate you all. So let's all stand. Let's pray and give us time to the Lord. Heavenly Father, we love you. God, we thank you that we can be your children. Lord, that we are saved from our sins, Lord, and we get to be with you for eternity because of what you have done. And so, Lord, this morning, we pray that you'd help us to humble ourselves before you and your word. Lord, I pray that you'd help us to cry out to you in praise and worship. Lord, we don't deserve our blessings that you give us, but you pour them out so liberally in our lives. And so we want to give such a small thing back to you, just singing some songs. So we praise your name this morning, God. We pray that you would, by your spirit, teach us through your word, Lord, that we would hide it in our hearts and that we would uh, be more like you and be shaped uh, to be more like you. So God, we give this morning to you. We love you in Jesus' name. Amen. i 
just a sing for all that you've done for me. Jesus, I sing. Jesus, I sing for all that you've done for me. Praise the Lord this morning. You can be seated if you'd like. That's never failing. Let mercy fall on me. Everyone needs forgiveness. The kindness of a savior. The hope of nation. Savior, he can move the is mighty to save, and He is mighty to save forever. Author of salvation, heroes and conquer the grave. Jesus conquer the Take me as you find me, all my fears and failures, and fill my life again. I give my life to follow everything I believe in, Lord, I surrender. can move the mountains. My God is mighty to save, and He is mighty to save forever. Author of salvation, heroes in And he is mighty to save forever. Author of salvation, heroes and conquer the grave. Jesus conquer the grave. Savior, you can move the mountains. My God, you're mighty to save. You are mighty to save forever. Author of salvation, you rose and conquered the grave. Jesus conquered the grave. You rose and conquered the grave. And Jesus conquered the Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine, heir of salvation, purchase of God. Born of His Spirit, washed.
washed in his blood. This is my story. This is my story. This is my song. Praising my Savior all the day. This is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. Perfect submission, perfect submission, perfect delight, visions of now burst on my side angels descending bring from above echoes of mercy whispers of love this is my story this is my song praising my Savior all the day long and this is my story this is my song praising my Savior all the day long Perfect submission, all is at rest. I and my Savior am happy and blessed. Watching and waiting, looking above. Filled with his goodness, lost in his love. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior all the day. Praising my Savior all the day long. So you see it above. Seated above, enthroned in the Father's love. Destined to die, and poured out for all mankind. God's only Son, perfect and spotless one. He never sinned, but suffered as if he did. All authority, every victory is yours. All authority, every victory. Dancing Savior. Savior, worthy of honor and glory, worthy of all our praise. You are the King. Jesus. Okay. 
hand speaking the Father's plan you're sending us out a light in this broken land all authority Good to see you this morning. Please have a seat. And I've got uh, more than normal announcements, so let's uh, get through these. By the way, happy Mother's Day to you mothers. Thank you so much for how you serve your families for the Lord. And uh, it's just uh, great to be a parent today and love your children for the Lord. And so thank you for what you do. Um, quick uh, announcement before I really get into these. We had announced a couple weeks ago we're starting to record our services in terms of video to Vimeo. And it is also recording really well to YouTube, so you can watch a live services on either one. We have actually discovered one glitch that some of the uh, apps on some TVs, uh, I think mainly, uh, maybe even on some computers, don't play the live on Vimeo. So I just encourage you to stick with YouTube for now to watch those live services, and those are all working just fine uh, on everything that we have seen. Just want you to know about that. You can, of course, watch any of the recorded services uh, on either one, Vimeo or on YouTube. Okay, our seniors uh, uh, fellowship that gathers once a month is meeting in a couple of weeks on Thursday. You can sign up for that. Uh, they provide a meal for that. And so please, seniors, if you want to enjoy that fellowship, get to know others and just spend time together, please do sign up for that. Also, uh, today, we always love doing this. I think this is our third or fourth year doing this. We support the Modesto Pregnancy Center as a ministry. It's so I'm so thrilled with the ministry they do on the front lines of culture today, really, in helping uh, young, young moms make the right decision to keep children. And uh, so we're just really grateful for them. And so uh, they've done this for years, but we have these baby bottles as just a way of encouraging you to consider supporting that ministry in a personal way. And so we hand these out on Mother's Day and we collect them and send them to them on Father's Day in honor of parenting and children and all that. So you can grab one or more of these today if you want to and fill that and just bring it back between now and Father's Day and we'll make sure it gets to them. And so we just really do appreciate and care for their ministry. Also, in just a couple of weeks, we're going to finish on the 19th, the uh, Wednesday night children's ministry, Warriors for Christ. And so as we enter the summer, the last Wednesday in May and then through through the months, uh, Sundays or Wednesdays, excuse me, 
in August, we have our, our summer program. So parents, I want to encourage you, if you have children uh, K through sixth grade, bring them on Wednesday nights. They will be taught the gospel. The outline, a wonderful outline, is the evangelism explosion outline. And uh, just, I just can't tell you enough how much of a blessing it is for your children to learn the gospel and have it in their heart sown there. And it really will uh, solidify them in their walk with the Lord. So that's available. Uh, additionally, if you have uh, anyone here that wants to serve and help us with that, we'd love to have your help. Also, uh, coming in June, for June, July, and August, we're going to have a park day for uh, young mommies. And so if you want to come out, on, it's going to be on Thursdays from 10 to 11 a.m. And so we have a flyer for you to get that and to come on out. And uh, April will be there each week and there to just spend time with you and minister to you and just have a good time of fellowship. Uh, that is beginning in a few weeks in June. Also, we're very excited to announce the Lord uh, finally gave me the details in terms of just felt like he just downloaded into my mind what he wants us to do. I will be leading a parenting conference come October 1st and 2nd. And so that'll be a Friday night, Saturday, one session on Friday night, about five sessions on Saturday. And uh, there's a whole lot of confusion today about parenting and how do you biblically parent children and point them to the Lord. So that's what that is going to be designed at. So you can get a flyer for that and can even sign up now if you want to. But I really am just telling you that being so far out in terms of planning purposes to keep that October 1st and 2nd weekend uh, open. And so really looking forward to that ministry and what the Lord's going to do. And then finally, we've been announcing uh, ministry opportunities. Uh, we started last week with the, with the worship team and this week just want to emphasize the children's ministry. We always have needs in children's ministry, teachers, aides, and those that can hold babies and all that. But if you have an interest in serving in, in any facet, including Wednesday night with the Hope for Kids, please see Chris after the service at the table and you can ask any questions you want and we'll just be praying for you. It all should be led of the Lord. Uh, don't just jump in because uh, there's a need, but I think the Lord will lead if he wants you to serve and just trust him to speak to you about that. So that's it for announcements. Please stand one more song and then we'll get into John chapter three today. Lost are saved, find their way at the sound of your great name. Oh, condemned, feel no shame at the sound of your great name. And every fear has no place at the sound your great name the enemy he has to leave at the sound of your great name Jesus worthy is the lamb that was slain for us son of God and man you are lifted up and all the world will praise your great name your great name oh the weak find their strength at the sound of your great name souls receive grace at the sound of your great name the father lives they find their rest at the sound of your great name and the sick are healed and the dead are sound of your great name, Jesus, worthy is the Lamb that was slain for us, the Son of God and man, you are high and lifted up, and all the world will praise your great name. 
serve an amazing Savior. Please, while you're standing, open those Bibles. John chapter 3. We come to likely the most well-known chapter in the Bible. I think the most well-known verse. If you ever watch a football game and the John 3.16 signs up there. So here we go as the Lord blesses us with this passage. There was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews, and this man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. And Jesus answered and said to him, Most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. And Nicodemus said to him, How can a man be born again when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? And Jesus answered, Most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God, that which is born of the flesh is flesh, that which is born of the spirit is spirit. Do not marvel that I said to you, you must be born again. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this truth, Lord, the central truth to man's need. Every single person has ever lived needs to know he or she must be born again to see you, to see your kingdom, to be with you in your kingdom for eternity. And so, Lord, I just pray what we studied today would have all the life you intended to have and just let's continue to teach us by our amazing Savior, Jesus, and the words he had for Nicodemus. He was so patient with him, so loving, and yet so needed direct, neededly direct, Lord. So thank you, Lord. Minister to us now, we pray. And Lord, not just us, but wherever your church gathers in this community, show yourself mighty, we pray, Lord. And we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Please be seated. All right, so last week in this uh, journey, where it's uh, almost surprising how fast the time goes, we're in our 12th study here in the life and the ministry of Jesus. And last week we saw him clearing out the temple, and he was actually furious at the religious leaders because of all the things they had done, all the, all the taking advantage of people. I mean, here come people with an honest, earnest desire to worship the Lord, and they were ripping them off and with their animals and the way they exchanged the money and all these things. And so they were really misrepresenting the simplicity of coming to the Father. And so Jesus was furious with them. And, and I want you to notice here, I do want you to look back at chapter 2, verse 18. Because if you remember, they basically challenged Jesus when he cleansed the temple. And it says, so the Jews answered and said to him, what sign do you show us to us since you do these things? They're basically saying, by what authority do you think you have the nerve to come and clean out the temple. I mean, what, what, what is it that you think you have the right to do that? And the irony is he gave them a sign. The problem is it wasn't right in front of them. The sign he gave them was that he was going to raise himself from the dead three plus years into the future. So it's kind of interesting. I mean, what good is a sign if I don't see it? Of course, we're so visually driven and we want to see what we see right now. And only then will we believe, which is not really true with the religious leaders. He performed so many signs and yet they didn't come to him. They didn't believe in him. But anyway, here it is. He gave them a sign. They just didn't get it because they thought he was talking about the temple, not the raising of his body after three days. But then I want us to notice that ironically, Jesus gave them many signs because verse 23 then said during that same uh, time frame, he was there when he was in Jerusalem at the Passover during the feast. Many believed in his name when they saw the signs, plural signs, which he did. So it's very interesting that Jesus is now in his very public ministry. All of chapter 2 is filled with 
signs, if you will. Remember, there was the first sign, although privately, of the turning water into wine at the wedding of Canaan. That was not a public miracle. He wasn't yet to show himself in a public way. His going public was this cleansing of the temple and then giving them the sign that he would raise himself from the dead one day. But then he performed many, many signs. And I love it because it was Jesus' way of not just loving people. He didn't just give signs to show he was the Messiah. He loves people. He wanted to minister to them and touch them and touch their lives while he performed these signs. So ironically, the religious leaders had what they needed to know he was the Messiah. By the way, we always need to know, and I, I say it regularly on these signs, it's not just signs alone. I mean, we need to be careful. Just because somebody can perform a miracle doesn't mean they're from God. Satan's a great deceiver, and the Antichrist will be a great deceiver and perform legitimate, what looks like legitimate miracles and signs. Jesus also fulfilled scripture, and there's just so many other ways we know he is the Messiah. For many signs, and that, that really, that verse 23 is what sets up chapter 3. As this Pharisee man comes to Jesus, and his first statement is going to relate to those signs he had just performed. So let's look at verse 1. We are told, there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. Now, I am just so grateful that this Pharisee came to Jesus. See, the religious leaders of their day, we know from history and reading the scriptures, totally gapped who he was. I mean, just, I, should, I, I, I guess I couldn't say totally, because I believe this man came to the Lord. I mean, we're going to see him at the, at the end of Jesus' life after he dies, openly caring for the body of Jesus, bringing many pounds of aloes and, and myrrh and, and openly identifying with Christ. But here at this point, he just knows Jesus has done miraculous things. He wants to know about him. So here he comes, a Pharisee. And Pharisees were mightily respected in their day. I mean, if, if anybody would have said, There's, name someone you most likely you know they're saved, they would have likely said Nicodemus or the high priest or someone, yet the man's not saved yet. So here he is. He's a man of the Pharisees. So very, very highly respected, very powerful men. They led the Sanhedrin. Within the Sanhedrin, there was two primary sects, the Pharisees, which were the dominant sect, then the minority sect, the Sadducees. He was one of those, so a man of tremendous reputation. Of course, they were so focused on the keeping of the law of Moses, they totally gapped Jesus here. But here's an honest man coming to Jesus. Now, his name is very, very accurate uh, to his role. Nicodemus was a ruler of the Jews. And the word Nicodemus is interesting. It's a compound word. Nico means to rule over. And Demas means people. He's a ruler of the people. And that's exactly what his role came to be. Very interesting that uh, he had me named that apparently by his parents. And here he is, in effect, fulfilling his role. But I love his humility. I really do. He's not too proud to recognize, I need more information. I'm going to go to Jesus rather than assuming things about Jesus. So then we read, this man came to Jesus by night and spoke to him. Now, some people think that his coming by night was, I don't know, kind of a cop out or something like he was afraid to be noticed by the other religious leaders. And that very well may be. But whether it was or not, let's give him the credit for coming to Jesus. And that's what a person needs to do. You know, he didn't let their, their thinking stop him from coming to him. He actually went to meet with him. And so whether it was or not a motive, I just say thank you, uh, Nicodemus, for being humble enough to admit you need more information here. So often we're not honest and humble with the information we've been given, but Nicodemus was. And so he came to him by night. I tend to think he wanted to come by night so he wouldn't be interrupted. I mean, especially you get Jesus, an audience with Jesus at night. Who's going to be coming up and interrupting your conversation? But now let's notice what he said to Jesus. I mean, his opening line, if you will, to Jesus is he called him rabbi, which is very significant. For you to be, we're going to see in verse 10, Jesus called him the teacher of Israel. There's actually a definite article there. He's, he was considered the greatest teacher of the things of God in Israel at the time. And he doesn't know what he's talking about. It's pretty amazing. We're going to see how ignorant he is about the single most important thing a person needs to do to be born again. He doesn't know the truth, but he called Jesus rabbi. That word means teacher or master. And for a guy that's considered the best rabbi teacher in all of Israel, to, to say that to Jesus is a great statement of humility, I believe. But even more important than that, the next two words are what really gets my attention. We know that you are a teacher come from uh, come from God. 
for no one can do these things, these signs uh, that you do unless God is with him. So the first question is, I don't know if you ever read this, who's the we? This is not just him that, that knows something special about Jesus. I believe it's all the other Pharisees. I don't think he's talking about his family. I don't think he's talking about his friends, although many of the Pharisees were friends. I think he's actually admitting, we Pharisees know you're something special, which this is quite an indictment on the other Pharisees because it's sad how somebody can know the truth and they're so full of pride in whatever, they're not willing to admit what they need. So we know. Uh, by the way, the word know there, there are different words for know in the Greek. This is a word that means uh, a knowledge that comes by uh, perception. See, we can sometimes be taught something, but not actually have our hands on it or, or get it by experience. We just can perceive it. And that's the word used here. He doesn't know by experience yet, and Jesus is going to point that out later. He doesn't know who Jesus is by experience. He hasn't actually put his faith in Christ yet. So he's basically saying, we perceive that you are a teacher come from God. And he even gave his reasoning with the word for. This is a reason word. For no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. Now, that's not technically true because we know Satan can perform signs and miracles and the Antichrist will. But this is one of the great proofs Jesus is, in fact, the Messiah. So what a statement. I mean, what, what an opening line to the conversation here. And so what I love here is the directness of Jesus in verse 3. He's basically admitting, I know you're something special and I need to get this right. And then Jesus says, okay, in effect, now that you're earnestly seeking, let me get to your greatest need. Make no mistake, verse 3 is the greatest need of any person that has ever lived. A person must be born again to be saved. And, and what I love about this is Jesus just flat says it. Jesus answered and said, most assuredly I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Now, that alone is a tremendous lesson, I think, when we're witnessing for the Lord. And I just really believe, and I say it regularly, I believe we're in the near the very end of the end times before the rapture of the church. And I think there's a, there's a problem sometimes, and I know we want to be led of the Lord, but we can so beat around the bush or be so patient with someone, we never tell them the truth. Yeah. And we need to just get to the truth. And, and, and when we lovingly say it, and by, I always believe we need to ask permission to share the gospel with people because God's a gentleman and he doesn't run over people. But Nicodemus is ready for the truth. Jesus knows it. And he says, uh, a person must, and I like the words, unless one is born again, he cannot. I mean, this is, these are clear black and white statements of truth. The world doesn't like clear truth. And yet here's Jesus giving these clear truths. This statement is what kicks off this entire conversation back and forth. And Jesus being incredibly patient now that he's given the truth. Because Nicodemus can be very, very confused here. I mean, the teacher of Israel, he is thoroughly confused. I mean, he's just, I think he's really realized he's immediately in over his head. And so he's going to ask some questions. And I want to give Nicodemus credit here. Uh, I'll put it this way. Have you ever been in a conversation with a group of people and they talk about something you don't understand? Have you ever been tempted to feign like you know what they're talking about? Like, you just act like, and you're hoping they don't ask you a question because you don't know what you're talking about, Right. If I'm sitting with Einstein in a group of people, and he's dead, but if you're sitting around with a group of scientists talking about, you know, E equals MC squared, I'm like, I'm going to listen, but I don't know what you're talking about. I mean, just admit it. Just, I don't know what you're talking about. But there can be a temptation to act like, yeah, I got it, I got it, and you don't know what in the world is going on here. Well, Nicodemus is in that place, and he's openly admitting it's a very humble place, although it really cracks me up, his questions. He asked Jesus two questions because he's so confused. The second one's the funnier one. But first one, how can a man be born when he is old? I mean, we don't know how old he was, but it's, it's said in that day he had to be at least 40 to be a member of the Sanhedrin. And, and he's the teacher of Israel, so he's probably many years in. He's probably in his 70s in that rough neighborhood. So this is a man with some serious experience, and he's like, I'm really confused. Would I have to be born again? I mean, what is this physical birth again? But here's the funny one. The second, can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? And I just love it. I just, I can all wish I could see the wheels in his head spinning as he's trying to do this. I'm talking about serious mental gymnastics of a man that age thinking about coming through his mother's womb again and uh, through the birth canal. I mean, if you think a baby's big at 10 or 11 pounds, I mean, Nicodemus here is like, I need help. I don't have any idea what you're talking about. 
So he's actually thinking of another physical birth. And he's thoroughly confused. And what Jesus is going to do here is priceless. And it teaches us not only do we need to be direct with people, but once we're direct, try to talk in as common, simple, explainable terms as we can to speak truth. Always trust the Lord to fill in the blanks. I mean, it's just amazing when you see our teams go out and share the gospel. And it's amazing that some of you think, oh, I just, just, just did a horrible job explaining that. And they're ready to receive the Lord. And some of oh, man, I couldn't have made that clear. And they're not ready. I mean, it's, it's all the work of the Spirit in the end. But we want to be as clear as we possibly can. But he's confused. He's confused. And so notice what Jesus said. And what, what Jesus does here is prices. What he does, in my opinion, is he goes through four illustrations so, you know, Jesus loved parables. He loved illustrations. He would take something physical people understood and speak that truth, and it would relate to a spiritual truth so that people can make the leap from a physical truth to a spiritual truth. He's going to give them four illustrations. And, and so the first one is in verses 5 and 7. He's now going to explain to him what it means to be born again. And so you may go, wait, if you're born again, there means there's a first birth and the second birth. What are those? And so notice Jesus' first illustration, verse 5. Most assuredly, I say to you, unless, this is the same language, one is born of water and the Spirit. So there's the birth and the second birth. The first birth is of water. The second birth is of the Spirit. He cannot enter the kingdom of God. He basically repeats that in another way in verse 6. That which is born of the flesh is flesh. That's the water part. And that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. That's the spirit part. So Jesus is now said in three different ways, if you will, between verse, verse 3 and then verses 5 and 6. Okay, first you have that water birth. And if you're here in this room today and you are here, you had a water birth, flesh birth. So whether you call it a, a first birth, a birth here of water, or a birth that, of flesh, you know that day you were born, that was the day you were born of water. Born of flesh. Every one of us in this room has been born of the flesh. But the problem is, we all needed a spiritual birth. That part that's missing. Now let's remind ourselves, I want to just go back, a quick little history lesson. Why is this needed? And, and you can even also wonder, you know, he's going to tell him here after he says this, that he shouldn't marvel there. Verse, do not marvel. Now how could Jesus have said, do not marvel? In effect, what he's saying is, you should have gotten it by reading the Old Testament that a person needs to be born again. You should have gotten this. So how is that true? Well, we go back to the creation, Genesis 1. And when God made Adam and Eve, we know in those six days, and on the sixth day he made Adam, and he made him as a physical being, but he also made him as a spiritual being. And of course, the Bible tells us God breathed on him. Now, now Adam was really blessed because he had a physical and spiritual birth, both at the same moment. When God breathed physical life into him, he also breathed spiritual life into him. It was the very breath of God that gave him physical and spiritual life. The more important is the spiritual part. So he was made alive spiritually. That's why Genesis 1 tells, or tells us there that, uh, that he was born in the image of God, since God is primarily a spirit. Yeah, we know Jesus took on human flesh, but God's spirit, we're going to see in John 4, and you must worship him in spirit and truth. What the Lord is saying there is, I made him alive both ways. Both ways he was born alive, and so he was alive physically and he was alive spiritually. Therefore, he had a perfect relationship with me. We walked in the garden, talked, and all these beautiful things until the day sin entered the world. And then we know God had warned him, when you eat of that tree, you will surely die. And we know he did, and we know he died. And at that moment, he'd experienced spiritual death. Now he needs to be made spiritually alive again. So he needed a rebirth at that point. And the Lord made this crystal clear in Genesis 5. When in Genesis 5.1, I'm not going to go there and read it for you, but in Genesis 5.1, the Lord reminded us Adam was made in the image of God. But then Genesis 5.3 says when he had a son named Seth, Seth was born in his image. See, he was dead spiritually because of his sin, and so you can't pass something on to your children you don't have. So when he had his son, he was born dead spiritually. So see, Seth wasn't, wasn't, didn't come out of the, his mother's womb like his dad, alive physically and spiritually. He was only alive physically. And he needed a rebirth. He needed a spiritual birth. And that death has been passed on to every single person that has ever lived, except Jesus. So when you and I were born, yeah, we had our first birth, but we did not have a second birth until the day we got this chapter right in our minds and we put our faith and belief in Jesus and were born again. So Nicodemus should have gotten this. 
And so it's not about going back through the mother's birth canal and all these mental gymnastics he's playing. He needed to be born of the spirit, verse 5, and that which is born of the spirit is spirit. And he's saying, you should get it. You should know. And you shouldn't marvel at these things. Nicodemus, you need to be born again. So that's very clear. Well, that's just one illustration. Jesus is a, the consummate teacher. He's the teacher of Israel, not Nicodemus. So he gives a second illustration, and that of wind, and I, and I love it. Notice he says, the wind blows where it wishes, and you hear the sound of it, but cannot tell where it comes from or where it goes. So is everyone who is born of the Spirit. And he drives home at the end of that, you need to be born of the Spirit, and you're only born of the Spirit when the wind of the Spirit comes, to, comes in you. And it's interesting choice of words. Now think about it. God breathed on Adam, so there was a wind, the wind of the Spirit to went into Adam. And then after Jesus rose from the dead in John 20, for the first time since creation, there's one kind of exception in Ezekiel 37, but Jesus came to his disciples. Now that he died and risen, proving his power over sin and death, he breathed on his disciples again. And now that sin had been paid for, now man can receive spiritual life again. In the Old Testament, people were saved. Of course, they had life, but they, they weren't able to have this indwelling of the Holy Spirit until sin was actually paid for. So now this is a new experience. He breathed on his disciples and said, receive the Holy Spirit. And now a person at the moment of faith, the Holy Spirit, the wind of the Holy Spirit comes into their lives. And it's so interesting to me that the, the different analogies for the Holy Spirit in Scripture, wind, water, and you just think about it, They're both needed for life on this planet, but wind and water and the oil, oil of the Holy Spirit. And... And we know that, uh, I love the analogy also, because wind is something you can't see. You can only see its effect on people. So when a person comes to Christ, the Holy Spirit comes in to live in them, and then you begin to see the change that the wind of the Holy Spirit brings. By the way, one last thing that is, you'll find fascinating, I think, is it is amazing how some words are translated in Scripture. But the, in verse 8, the word wind and spirit at the beginning, and end, they're the same word. Isn't it fascinating that that word is actually the word for the Holy Spirit is translated wind in Scripture? He is the wind of God, the breath of God in us. And so when a person is born of the Spirit and the wind of the Spirit comes into them, they're born again. Now, at this point, I love what he does. The Lord gave the two illustrations. But at this point, he hasn't yet, still yet told Nicodemus how to be born again. And that's what he's going to cover in his third illustration. But before we get to that third illustration for the next couple of verses, really primarily 9 through 13, Jesus is going to make some comments to Nicodemus, in effect, about Nicodemus. And I don't think in any way he's putting him down. He's just making it clear for anyone that would come read it later that even the great Nicodemus, the teacher of Israel, did not get what he was being told. You can be very, very wise and still not get the truth. In fact, it's a work of the Spirit to really understand. There can be very wise, there can be very wise people in the world that even know I'm a sinner, know I need Jesus, and still not be willing to come to the Lord. But anyway, notice what he says. Well, after he said all this, you know, this whole picture of birth, and I need a second birth, a spiritual birth, and the wind does what it does, Nicodemus answered and said, how can these things be? And I really commend him for being honest. You know, at this point, he's almost probably feeling ashamed. He's so ignorant. And you know there would be a great temptation to feign knowledge here, feign understanding, but I really love his, his uh, really humility, his great humility. It takes humility to get saved. It takes a, a humility to admit, I am a sinner. I am not worthy of getting into heaven because of standards perfection. I need a Savior who died for me. Of course, Nicodemus doesn't get any of this yet, but notice what Jesus said to him. And again, he's not putting him down. Are you the teacher of Israel and do not know these things? Now, that is quite a statement. And Jesus is appropriately putting Nicodemus in his place. You know, these Pharisees thought they had all the answers to everything in life and how to come to God. And this is how a person saved. And the greatest teacher didn't know this. Wow. How can that even be? By the way, you should know the word know there is a different word from know in verse 3 when he said, we know that you're a teacher. This is the word in verse, uh, verse 10 of a knowledge that comes by experience. You see, Nicodemus had not yet put his faith in Christ, so he didn't know by experience the Savior. 
And you must come to a knowledge by experience of the Savior to be saved, and you only come to that by faith. So he said, he said, you're the teacher, and you don't know by experience these things? He's going to tell them in a couple of verses how to know. But at this point, he doesn't. And then and I love what Jesus does. In, Most surely I say to you, we speak what we know and testify what we have seen, and you do not perceive our witness. Now, I asked who's the we in verse 2, I think was the Pharisees. So who's the we here? It has to be the Trinity. Has to be. Humans didn't understand this, this powerful truth. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, the three members of the Godhead, all called God in Scripture, and yet the Bible says there's one God. They knew. And it is a little fascinating that the word know is again the perception. So Jesus saying, we, the Godhead, we perceive the truth. How do we perceive it? Because we've seen it. I mean, Jesus could have easily used the word gnosko, but it's, I think he's kind of a play on words going back to what Nicodemus was saying. Can you perceive one thing? Your we? Our we's the right we. We're the ones that know the truth. I mean, that, you think about if you were in a classroom and there's a, a, some group on one side that believes 2 plus 2 equals 4 and one group believes 2 plus 2 equals 5. One of them knows the truth and one's wrong. We've got to get that right. Somebody's wrong. Somebody is right. Jesus said, we're the ones that know truth. You don't know it. He is not putting him down, but he needs him to get. He does not know the truth. You don't know it, Nicodemus. You don't know it. So we know. We know. And by the way, did you notice he said, and you do not receive our witness? The word you there is in the plural. He is saying, you, you, we, you Pharisees, you don't get it. Because you still think you can be righteous by the keeping of the law of Moses rather than faith in the one who will keep the law of Moses, me. So that's why you're wrong. He didn't go into that detail. But anyway, he's going to make it clear how to be saved in a minute. But I love what Jesus is doing. And then Jesus even said, if I've told you earthly things and you do not believe. I mean, just I, I give this very simple imagery of being born physically, being born spiritually. And you don't even get that. You need to learn a few things to get this right. So if I've told you heaven, uh, earthly things and you do not believe, how will you believe if I tell you heavenly things? I, mean, I can't even really go into that. You can't even understand this simple truth that I am speaking to you. No one has ascended to heaven, but he who came down from heaven, that is the Son of Man who is in heaven. So what I'm telling you about is the fact that the Son of Man is going to come down to this earth, live that perfect life, die on the cross to pay for your sins. And Nicodemus would have known that phrase, Son of Man, which is used primarily in the book of Daniel, is a clear statement of deity. It is clear. He's saying, I am God the Son. I'm here as the Son of Man. And I'm here to pay for the sins of the world. Nicodemus would have known that. That Jesus is the Son of God, Son of Man, come down from heaven. He's made it very clear what his credentials are as the Son of God, Son of Man. And he's telling him, um, I'm the one who came down from heaven. And then he goes into the third of the four illustrations, and I believe the clearest one about the serpent on the pole. And I absolutely love this analogy. I say it frequently and I mean it. The greatest commentary on the Bible is the Bible. Right? We, we like to use analogies in explaining truths, but the greatest commentary on the Bible is another part of the Bible. It's the word of God affirming the word of God. And that's what Jesus is going to do here. And he's going to give him the clearest, simplest explanation of how a man is saved hoping Nicodemus would finally get it. And I do believe he does, even though we're not told that in here. But notice what he says here in verse 14. As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so the Son of Man must be lifted up, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. Now, I want to read that actual passage. Because if you know uh, your scripture, this, what Jesus is talking about here, uh, this uh, picture of the serpent on the pole that Moses was told to, made, to make, one. Let me tell you the quick story, and then I'll read a handful of verses. When the people of Israel had gotten out of Egypt and they're wandering during the 40 years of, of the wilderness, the Lord was providing for them. And, and of course, they're human. It's amazing how good a complainers we are, isn't it? I mean, I mean, there was a, if complaining were an Olympic sport, the Olympics come and say, how many of you would vie for the gold medal. It's just funny how, what good complainers. Well, they're in the wilderness. God's providing for them. He's gotten them out of the bondage. They were in a picture of the freedom from the bondage of sin to now walk with the Lord. <clears throat> and they're complaining. And after all the Lord had done for them, he was upset enough that he sent 
basically sicked a bunch of venomous snakes on them. They start biting people. They start dying. And the people realized we've complained against God and we've complained against Moses. We're sorry for what we've done. We need you to save us, Lord. Save us. So let me read it. Numbers 21, verse 4. They journeyed from Mount Hor by way of the Red Sea to go around the land of Edom. And the soul of the people became very discouraged on the way. And the people spoke against God and against Moses. And they said, why have you brought us out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? For there is no food and no water. And our soul loathes this worthless bread. So the Lord sent fiery serpents among the people. And they bit the people Many of the people of Israel died. I mean, people are actually dying as the whole world's dying from sin. And therefore, the people came to Moses and said, We have sinned. Good, they admitted it. We have spoken against the Lord and against you. That's the picture of repentance. Jesus said you must repent and believe. That's the first part in this imagery. And you pray the Lord that he take away the serpents from us. So Moses prayed. And then the Lord said to Moses, Here's my, here's my solution. Moses, you make a fiery serpent and set it on a pole. It should be that everyone who is bitten, when he looks at it, shall live. There it is. So they repented and admitted they were wrong about what they were doing, complaining against God. God provided a solution, and it's a solution of faith. You get bit, and, and from now on, so it's Mother's Day. You're sitting there one day. You're in this wilderness experience. My mom gets bit, and I've seen other people dying. My mom's going to die, and I sure want a solution. I don't want my mom to die. I want her to live. What do I do? Oh, Moses told us what to do. By the way, try to put yourself in Moses' shoes. How would you like to explain this? Moses goes, hey, everybody, you complained against God and you're dying and you actually know people that have died. I'm going to make a snake and put it on a pole. And if you're bitten and you know you're going to die because you're seeing everybody that's bitten die because everybody dies from sin, you just look at this serpent by faith and you'll live. Now, how do you think the people responded to that? How do you think Moses is thinking this is going to go over? They're going to think I've lost my mind. I am crazy. I'm crazy. I think there would be a couple of potential responses, right? And I want to relate these because we can relate to Moses today in the exact same way when we share the gospel. Because we're giving the same message. Only back then it was only a saving from a physical death. We get to see people saved from a spiritual, eternal death. So when we go tell someone, hey, there's a serpent on a pole. Serpent represents something rejected by the world that the world considers evil. That's Jesus on the cross. The snake was lifted up. Jesus was lifted up. And I'm telling you, when you share the gospel, just like Moses, you may feel like Moses and go, they're going to think I'm crazy. Yeah, we need to get over that. Some are going to think you're crazy. They're going to think you're a Jesus freak. And I'd say amen to that. That's a good thing to be a Jesus freak. So there, some people think you're crazy. Yet there's another group of people that are going to say, well, he's not crazy, but that's just too easy. That's just too simple. And there's that twisted part of our flesh, and I get it. Some part might not say it's twisted, but there's that part of our flesh that we know the world we live in, there's really nothing free, is there? I mean, there's always a catch. There's always something. There's always some advertising, some something. But when something's legitimately free, we just don't grasp that. That's too easy. By the way, the thing people need to know to get over that is, oh, it, it wasn't free. It's just free to you. Because Jesus paid a phenomenal price going to that cross. The price was paid. It was not technically free. It's just free to us. So there's the type of person who's going to think you're crazy. There's a type of person who's going to think that's just too easy. No, it is that easy because God wanted all people saved. So unless a child could understand it, God wouldn't have made a message that way. And then the third view is, somebody might actually believe. Praise God. They're going to go, you know what? I've got nothing to lose. And, and, and I believe I am going to die from, from this thing called sin, venom bite physically, sin spiritually. And I need, to, I need to turn to this Jesus because he did live that perfect life. He's the one on the pole. I can put my faith in him. And so some will turn and believe. And that's when we say, amen, God. Thank you for letting me deliver the message. And whether they turn, that's between you and them. And so be like Moses and deliver the message. So that's what he's saying there. And so notice how Jesus made this so clear. To look at that serpent on the pole is equivalent to whoever believes. And he did tell us in that passage, anyone who's bitten can look at that and live. And so I love what he says. Whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. Verse 16, he tells us why God made this option available 
4, that's a because word, because God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. So the father sent Jesus down here to be that serpent on a pole to take our sin away, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting. everlasting. Did you notice he said the same thing in verse 15 and 16? When God repeats himself, that's very important. He says, whoever can believe in him and not perish. But, and, I, and I like that he says the negative and the positive. In effect, if you believe in him, you will not perish, but you'll positively have life. And then he repeats it in verse 16. Should not perish, but have everlasting life. And then he even says, for God did not send his son into the world to, to condemn the world, but the world through him might be saved. Jesus didn't come in his first coming to condemn the world. He will in his second coming. He's going to condemn the world. And he's going to rejuvenate for a thousand year reign and then do away with it entirely for a brand new heaven and earth for eternal reign. But he did not come to condemn the world. And it's because his focus was to live a perfect life and die for us, to give us an opportunity to be saved. And then he tells us in verse 18 why he didn't come to condemn. He who believes in him is not condemned, but he who does not believe is condemned already. Why? Because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. I love that. He says, basically, I didn't need to come to condemn you. You're already condemned. From the moment Adam sinned, and then you and I were born, some of you might say, well, that's unfair. I was born dead spiritually. By the time you got to be one year old, we've sinned. And our whole adult life, we sin every single day. We know we deserve that judgment. We're all condemned. We're all under condemnation. And we all need to turn to a Savior, so we're all in that place of condemnation. I want to put up an overhead just to drive home the point of how crystal clear Jesus was here. And so, um, there we go. I want you to notice, I want to focus on the words believe and not in these verses. Verse 15, whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. Verse 16, whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. Verse 18, he who believes in him is not condemned. Can God have been any clearer that you just need to truly believe in Jesus and you're not going to perish? You're not going to be condemned. And even at the end of this chapter, John the Baptist is going to say, he who believes in the Son has eternal life. So clear. And then the negative, where he puts the word not instead of the believe part rather than the perish or condemn part. Verse 18, he who does not believe is condemned already. Verse 36, he who does not believe the Son shall not see life. The wrath of God abides on him. God can't be clear. It's interesting how some people think the Bible is so confusing. And, and of course, without the indwelling Holy Spirit, it, it is quite confusing. But anybody can read that and get that truth. Believe in him, have eternal life. Do not believe, damned, perish, condemned. There it is. Very, very clear. But what I love is finally in this analogy, he used an analogy Nicodemus thoroughly understood. And now Nicodemus can get it. Okay, they looked at that snake in faith and they were saved physically. And now I can look at the snake in the picture, in the imagery of Jesus that was rejected by men. And I can receive spiritual life. They receive physical life, believe in Jesus, spiritual life. That's what it means to be born again. And so I love how Jesus made it so clear to this man. And then he gives his final analogy here. And verses 19 to 21. And by the way, I, I look at this as in two different ways. You can look at this fourth analogy as an, another illustration or analogy, but it's kind of a dual thing. It's not just an illustration. The Lord Jesus also gives Nicodemus one of the primary reasons why a person doesn't come to faith, why they don't believe in Jesus. And here it is. And this is the condemnation. Since he just mentioned, if you don't believe you're condemned, this is condemnation. Light has come into the world. That's him. Because in John 8, he's going to say, I am the light of the world. He came into the world. Light has come into the world, but here's why many people don't come. Because men loved darkness rather than light, because their deeds were evil. See, it's so sad that a person can hear this message. No, unequivocally, I am a sinner. You might even admit that. You might even actually confess that. I'm a sinner. Might even actually confess, not only am I a sinner, but because of that sin, I can't get into heaven based on anything I've done because the standard's perfection. But then miss the last part that I actually have to believe in Jesus. And some people simply will not come for one simple reason. They don't want to stop their sin. Because they think if I come to Christ, I need to stop my sin. And the irony is 
Once you come to Christ, the Holy Spirit comes to live in you, and then he gives you the will and the power to do of his good pleasure. He'll give you the desire to obey him. He'll even take away that draw towards sin. And of course, we know we still have flesh, so of course we're still going to struggle with it. But we now have this ability and wisdom to go, Lord, what a blessing to walk with you. What a blessing. So men love darkness rather than light. And so he said, for everyone practicing evil hates the light and does not come to the light, lest his deeds should be exposed. Now, I don't think this needs any help in our culture today, does it? Just watch our culture today. And when we stand there and say, God is a God of the living. He's a God of life and he wants life. He doesn't want us to take a baby's life in the womb. They're going to hate you for it. It's just the way it is. Because we love our sin. And the big tolerance of our day, let's face it, all the tolerance today, it's amazing. I've never heard them say, hey, you know, if you rob a bank, you know, you have to be tolerant. No, it all has to do with sex, right? Everything we see today, whether it's a transgenderism or homosexuality or even just plain man, woman, fornication, and then, and then aborting, it all has to do with sex. The world just can't tolerate you telling me I don't get to do that. That's why they hate the light. That's, it's just very simple. We get why people don't want to walk away from that. We get it. Because we know that. We know our flesh we have. We get the struggle. So some people won't come for that reason. But he who does the truth comes to the light, that his deeds may be clearly seen, that they have been done in God. So Jesus gave four illustrations today to speak truth, that we would get it. He wants us to know the truth. He gave very patiently, four illustrations, and the third illustration made it crystal clear to Nicodemus how to be saved is to simply, by faith, look to the cross and believe in Jesus, and he even gave some of the reasons, the main reason why, I think, they don't want to walk away from their sin. And Jesus is going to deliver this message throughout his ministry. I mean, in John 5, we're going to read, most assuredly, I see that he who hears my word and believes in him who sent me has everlasting life. So a person has to make a decision. Will they put their faith and trust in Christ? That's how a person is born again. And I love the clarity of it. I love the simplicity of it. Nicodemus clearly should have walked away from this, knowing exactly what he needed to do. I believe he did come to the Lord because of what we see later when Jesus died. And I thank God that he likely got saved. But I'll close today with four simple applications for us as a body of Christ. Number one, we are never to let others' views of Jesus affect our view. See, that we know in verse two, there's a temptation to look at somebody else we think is really smart, like Nicodemus, and go, he doesn't believe it, so I won't. That is foolishness. Anyone can be wrong. In fact, many, many are wrong. Isn't it interesting and sad how many people say, I don't want to get saved because you're a bunch of hypocrites. Well, yeah, get saved and join the club. I mean, we're all hypocrites, right? Because we all have flesh. We still struggle. It's just a proof of how great God's grace is. And yes, we're fighting to be more like Christ and all that, but we're all hypocrites, really. You know, there is no perfect church because we're all still sinners, but we're saved by grace. Secondly, it's possible to know a lot about Jesus, but not truly know him. See, Nicodemus is getting more and more insights about Jesus, but he still doesn't quite know what it means to be saved, and he needed to know the truth, and that's why Jesus spoke the truth to him. So don't let your views, others' views, affect coming to Christ. And then, and then secondly, don't just know about Jesus. You actually have to put your faith in him and trust him. Because if you do not think you have to put your faith in Christ, what you're really saying is, I'm good enough to get in. And it's quite an insult to him. You're really saying he didn't need to die on the cross. I can get in on my own. And that is not true. Thirdly, in order to be saved, a person must be born again by repenting, admitting they need the Lord, and believing in him. That's what it means to be born again. I believe in Jesus as my Lord and my Savior. That must be done. That's important to know why Jesus used such strong language, unless, cannot, and then these believe in him and not, right, not perish and not be condemned so we never weaken or water down the gospel. Because now we're not helping anybody if we water down the gospel. You must be born again. There is no other way. I'm just so thrilled God made a way, and it's in a great way. Because I don't have to earn it. If I had to earn it, I'd be worried about doing something and unearning it through my sin and whatever. So a person must be born again by believing in Jesus. Fourthly, we're to speak to people in common terms as simple and clear and direct as we can. We need to not beat around the bush today because the stakes are too high. 
You must be born again. So don't soften it. Don't beat around the bush. Deliver the message and then speak in as plain a terms as you can. If you have to, take Jesus' lead. Talk about a serpent on a pole. We can get that physical story and say, in the same way you need to believe in Jesus and a person can be saved. So I thank the Lord Jesus. Give the truth, give it directly, tell them their greatest need, and then explain it as simply as you can and let the Holy Spirit do the rest of the work. And don't ever apologize for it because it'll save. It's the power of God unto salvation for everyone who believes. And thank God for it. Let me close in prayer and then we'll celebrate communion today. Lord, I thank you for this passage. I thank you for the simple clarity of it. So simple, so clear, so direct. Believe and be saved. Do not believe, not saved. We're so thankful that we receive spiritual life, born again by believing in Jesus. Thank you, Jesus, for making it so clear. Thank you, Father, for sending Jesus and then having Jesus make the, the case so clear, so simple, that even a child can understand their need to believe in Jesus. And so we praise you today. We thank you today. We remember Jesus today as our amazing Lord and Savior. And you walk with him. Lord, if there's anyone in this room right now that has not put their faith in Christ, they don't know for sure they're born again. May you so convict them they will not leave this place today without forever surrendering to Jesus, admitting they're a sinner and need him and believe in him today. We don't want them to walk out here. I know you don't want them to walk out. So please convict them to stay and settle this, settle this with you. You'll save them today, and it's an eternal life that they can keep and hold for eternity. Thank you, Lord. We thank you and praise you for these things. In Jesus' name, amen. We get to celebrate communion today, so please turn a little bit forward to 1 Corinthians 11. And uh, by the way, as I'm getting there, is anyone here that needs the elements? Anybody didn't grab the, the, the juice and the, the, and the bread here? We'll get that to you. Please turn to 1 Corinthians 11 again. So it's our practice once a month to celebrate communion. And so what we're going to do is do that today. And it's our practice for you to get to get those elements in your hands. And let me read a little bit here and tell you how this goes. In verse 23, 1 Corinthians 11, 23, Paul said, I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the same night in which he was betrayed, he took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, take and eat. This is my body, which is broken for you. Here's the key. Do this in remembrance of me. Now that we're saved, those of us that, that are born again, because we put our faith in Christ, he wants us to never forget him. He's the reason we're saved. So the key word in communion always is the word remember. Remember, we get today to remember him. And that once again, fills us with gratitude. So what we're going to do is we're going to sing a song here. And after that, we're going to open up the cracker side of that. We're going to pray together and, and partake of that together. Then another song, and then we're going to open up to the Jew side and thank the Lord for that. Two symbols of what he did for us. But let's now worship the Lord, and then we'll partake, pray and partake of that together. Let's worship the Lord. The Savior say, Thy strength indeed is small. Child of weakness, watch and pray. Find in me thine all in all. Jesus, pay oh, oh, to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain he washed it white as snow and lord now indeed i find thy power and thine alone can change the leper spots and melt the heart of stone Jesus paid oh, oh, to him I owe sin had left a crimson stain he washed it white as snow Oh 
before the throne oh, I stand in Him complete Jesus died my soul to save my lips shall still repeat Jesus paid oh, to hell my own He washed in white as snow. take out this bread and the Lord did choose these two elements so we're holding the very bread that represents the body of Jesus and him coming the bread of life to die for us and so it's our practice when we have communion once a month to allow you to just a, a handful of you to, to say thanks to the Lord we're family we pray together we're supposed to love each other together so I'll go quiet for a few moments no no obligation on your part but you feel free to thank the Lord out loud for what he has done for you. Let's lift the bread before the Lord. Lord Jesus, we are so thrilled. Your word tells us in so many places, you created this earth and everything in it. And you knew you were gonna have to come die for us because of the mess we've made of things. We created the need to be born again by, by dying, by choosing sin. And you, you sent yourself, you came yourself to die for us. Father, you sent him. Jesus, thank you for coming. Thank you for living that perfect life. Father, thank you for sending him and being willing to watch your own son, another member of the Godhead, die such a gruesome death that we can have life. We're so blessed by what he did on that cross to take our sins upon himself and to raise himself from the dead. So today we remember Jesus with tremendous gratitude. It's our thrill to know Jesus by experience, not just by perception because we know you live in us. The wind of your spirit has given us the truth that we know that we know that we know. We're so grateful, Lord. So thank you for Jesus. Thank you for saving us, Father. And thank you that one day we will be with you forever and ever and ever because of him. So we thank you today and we ask in Jesus' name. 
Amen. Well, Jesus chose the two wonderful symbols, the bread representing his body, the wine, which we have the Jews to represent the shedding of his blood. And so it says in the same manner, he took the cup after supper, saying this cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. So he linked it to the blood and the death because a covenant doesn't take effect until the death of the person that made the covenant in terms of wills and all that picture. Jesus did it. So we remember his death. And so now we'll sing again and worship him. Then we'll partake of the juice in just a minute. Let's worship again. forgiven because you were forsaken I'm accepted you were condemned and I'm alive and well your spirit lives within me because you died and rose again well, I'm forgiven because you were forsaken I'm accepted You were condemned And I'm alive and well Your spirit is within me Because you died and rose again
let's take that and open up the juice. And he chose this because it represents his blood, which was shed for us for the remission of sins. Let's lift the cup before the Lord. Father, once again, we thank you for Jesus, our Savior. We can be born again because of what he did. We can put our faith in Christ and he will give us a spiritual birth. We've all had the physical birth, but the spiritual birth. And now that we're walking in you, we're so blessed by the working and the presence of the power of your Holy Spirit. All made possible because Jesus' body and blood which he willingly shed for us. So thank you, Lord. We praise you today. We remember Jesus. And in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And let's stand together. What's well, a beautiful thing to remember what Jesus has done for us as his children, his church. If you have not given your life to Christ, you're not born again. You've not known what it means to be born again. Please, again, do not leave this place without knowing that. God wants you saved. He loves you so much. No matter what you've done, he'll forgive it and he'll save you today. Please do not leave today without knowing that. But just rejoice today also for those of us that know him, what he has done. What an amazing God. Father, we thank you and praise you again for this service, your word, this passage, Jesus' tremendous clarity to a man that uh, many thought was the wisest man maybe in Israel in his day and he still needed to be saved. Thank you for the imagery, the picture, the power, your love for that man and for the rest of the world. We thank you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Oh, Savior, he can move the mountain. My God is mighty to save. He is mighty to save forever. Author of salvation. Have a great week, everyone. God bless you all and God bless your mothers.